Hello, everyone. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for being here. A uh, very warm welcome to our panelists. As you can see, we really have a par packed panel here for all of you today. Uh, as per our introduction, we're here really to deep dive into data uh, and the role of data and really shaping a customer experience, bringing through personalization, consistency, uh, loyalty, and much, much, much more, which I would leave that to our panel of experts here to share with us today. Uh, before we get started, gentlemen, I'd love to ask you on a personal note, uh, of course, you're all marketing experts here, but if you were to reverse the role and look at yourselves as a customer, can you quickly share one experience that each of you have had as a customer that has really stood out when it comes to experiencing a marketing campaign? Anything that really stands out to you? Um, Abhijit, maybe we can start with you. Sure. Uh, this campaign dates back to, let's say, 15 years back, probably, or 20 years back, when I just started my work life. And uh, I was like any other person trying to buy a car. And the campaign, which has always stood with me for many, many years, is Kitna uh, Deti by Maruti. Because whatever it is, what was, what was the, no one knew the mileages of the, uh, of the car, but it stood with me for many, many years. Thank you. Uh, well, I would not say a campaign as such, but uh, I would say experience overall uh, from the Oberoi hotels. I mean, uh, you travel so much across the world, but the kind of personalization and the kind of service that, you know, Oberoi has, you know, it it is even, uh, you know, better than the Marriott's and the Hilton's of the world. So I think uh, we are talking about personalization and that's what they really look into. Uh, you know, for example, in my previous company, I visited one of the Oberoi hotels. So I was working with Le Creuset and uh, we sell pots and pans. So, you know, the welcome was with uh, these small mini, you know, cocots of, uh, you know, they baked something and put cookies on that. So I think these are small things and every time you go there, you are like pleasantly surprised. So. Wonderful. Thank you. With them. Thank you for the question and pleasure to be part of this esteemed panel. Uh, I was going to use an example from the hospitality industry, Taj being my favorite, but I'm, I'm going to steer clear of that and probably derive from a customer experience, not necessarily of myself, but my seven-year-old son. And, uh, you know, as a marketing company, I think Cadbury has always stood out for me. Uh, as a professional, I have found myself appreciating the campaigns they put out year after year. Not just the campaign, but the product, the service, the entire experience around it. And that... That to me has become even more obvious when, when I look at, you know, my childhood, choices were limited and premiumization really meant paying a premium, right? So imported chocolates were really premium. You had no option but to kind of stick to Cadbury. I look at my son, he's got all the options in the world, but you know, the kind of innovation, the kind of campaigns, the kind of marketing which Cadbury is putting out there, I see despite having all the options, he's going to stick to a Cadbury. So, you know, that that's something to me which a successful marketing campaign and customer experience stands for. Wonderful. Ultimate brand loyalty. <laughs> Amit? Yeah, hi. Uh, first of all, good afternoon, everybody here. Uh, and uh, I, actually, it's a great, uh, you know, feeling of being part with great uh, team here. Uh, for me, actually, I would uh, say uh, more of a personal experience um, that goes way long back and it is still close to my heart. Uh, so Arun is here, my colleague. We used to travel in previous job um, in Swaj Group. So I used to go to this hotel called, uh, you know, Taj uh, Cochin. Uh, now it's Taj Bevanta. So b like a typical sales guy, we used to go sometime, used to do morning, evening. And uh, so I was taking my flight and I was supposed to go and take do my job in the day and then come back in the re evening flight. Then I happened to catch a client of mine. I said, oh, this is a good opportunity. Let me stay back. And uh, I had an early morning breakfast meeting with the same gentleman. Uh, but I don't have a fresh clothes to wear. You know? uh, so by that time, I finished my job. It went late night, dinner. And I went to my, uh, we checked in a hotel. And I said, you look, tomorrow morning, I, I, I have an important meeting. I need this, uh, you know, the fast service, dry cleaning services. And the gentleman says, it's already 12 o'clock, sir, and how do I get you? I said, uh, you know, 10 o'clock is my meeting, do something. Um, so I gave my shirt and I said, I can wear the suit at least, the jacket I can put, but I, I need a fresh shirt and all that stuff. Uh, so he took the shirt. Uh, next morning, he didn't give me a fresh shirt, but he gave me a new shirt. Uh, so I think uh, that was an amazing experience I have. And uh, 
they know you so well they know that i like that particular room sea facing uh, thing so every time you go you they know that you like that room so i think uh, that is something to learn from taj i i really feel proud what how they have done taking the service level to a, a global standard and probably setting an example so i think that's my favorite experience i have thank you you know there was this campaign called daag acche hain right so sometimes you're not a direct consumer of something but you still get influenced uh, from what you see and hear so i think surf had this campaign of daag acche hain and i asked my mom back in when i was in school i said mom why don't we use surf she said because uh, i use tide and i said why do you use tide she said lage aadha chale zyada so you know that was one campaign against the other and you know this is literally something that happened in my house where i said why are you not using it she said tight ka campaign hai you know so it's like how these campaigns play a very very interesting role in shaping our thoughts and our consumer choices as consumers so this is what came to my mind when you asked that so wonderful thank you gentlemen that really sort of sets the stage for expectations from all of you as marketing experts on what you expect out of the brands you interact with so thanks for that and uh, abhijit maybe you can help us kick start uh, this conversation just by really uh, helping us see what the role of data driven cx is in the industry today how has this impacted the retail industry as a whole for the consumers and retailers alike sure so i think if we if we see uh, what has happened in last decade or little over a decade is uh, marketers and retailers have moved over from the attitude of what i call it is spray and pray so you know it's not that targeting and segmentation never used to happen years back it used to happen but typically it was all advertising led so you used to come up with uh, regional or national campaigns that's what i call it spray and then pray that it will work for you we have moved from that stage over in last one decade to what i call it is individualistic engagement uh, where you know data has now become the new oil it has become the new gold for all retailers what it has done two parts of your question so what it has done for retailers one of course it has taught us how to be how to hyper personalize now hyper personalize not only in marketing micro marketing or advertising but also what i need to offer i'm from i stay in gurgaon so i i can say that uh, shop stop in delhi south delhi and shop stop in gurgaon definitely has a difference in the merchandise they are offering now that's what uh, hyper personalization and data is is helping second one big thing is we always talk about the b2c front or what's happening with the customer but biggest benefit of the data has been b2b how data has helped retailers streamlining uh, their merchandise mix their costing their supply chain and of course third we all know is uh, i mean that's more of uh, the omni channelization of the retailers or the established retailers in the country we are yet not there uh, all of us where uh, where probably the dot coms of the world are there uh, but that has also started happening uh, second part what I, what it has done to the uh, consumers uh, the biggest benefit of the consumer is the discovery you know probably look look at ourselves 10 years back for us to even decide which car to buy or which uh, let's say suit to buy we, we didn't have the proper discovery process today we have an the data has helped us today you search once you need a 3 bhk flat or a 4 bhk flat you'll start keep on seeing the ads of that over next few days so for consumer the biggest benefit has been the discovery and the second biggest benefit is the competition if we are able to reach our audience easily so is my comp- competition and that's finally helping consumers getting the either the price or the product or the promotion value thank you i have one more question for you though so given uh, these two premise that uh, really makes the cx uh, beneficial for the consumer how do you at delhi duty free harness it because after all the nature of your customer is transient they are always moving so how can you really uh, hone in on the personalization the customization and what role does data play in that sure i'll i'll take an example for us when we started this business in 2010 in india uh, we also used to think similar but over you know first 3 years we realized that every kind of a traveler is different now let let me give you some example what kind of travelers there are travelers who are only traveling for leisure who never travel for business who travel probably once in 3 years there are travelers who travel leisure every year once or twice there are business travelers there are people who only go with families 
there are travelers who only travel once in three, three years or four years, but they go on a very long vacation. So they, they generally tend to go to US, the Canadas of the world, 20 days, 30 days. So that way there are multiple different segments which, which exist. Now I'll, I'll take one typical example how data helped us. You know, uh, maybe with all of us here as well, we used to always think that Indians were staying abroad. There are two types of Indians who are staying abroad. One are NRIs and one are overseas Indians. OCIs and we always used to bucket them together and once we did a deep data dwelling we realized that NRIs come back to the country very frequently far far more frequently because they are generally in Middle East whereas OCIs are generally staying in the North America and, and Australia they come back in three years or four years now we never used to target them we had one you know one one shirt, one shirt fits all solution for all of them once we started actually started targeting them individually we started seeing most of them coming back and shopping with us Thank you for that. Um, Uttam, uh, next one's for you. Given the nature of uh, your industry, it's, it's so personalized. It's a very uh, touch and feel experience. So how do you go about integrating the data you collect in store as well as online to give your customers the ultimate personalized product in the end? Sure. Uh, so very, yeah. no. very, very interesting and, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a question which requires a little bit of insight into the category, right? So everyone knows mattress, comfort, home products are a kind of more of an in-store touch and feel uh, kind of products. But at the same time, these are bulky products. So you're uh, you're always going to be faced with a display constraint when it comes to retail. So you, there is always going to be a need to kind of balance between online, offline, digital, uh, you know, fidgetal. Uh, so, you know, how do you have virtual or digitized storefronts? How do you utilize a 500 square feet uh, retail outlet uh, to showcase your entire range, which may not be there physically, but it may be there virtually? How do you give the customer the same experience of uh, advocacy, which he's getting on the say uh, brand website or on, an, on a marketplace? How do you give, give it to him offline or vice versa, right? So how do you replicate the role of a salesperson who's Counseling a person, you know, uh, one of the panelists was mentioning during our introductions uh, how Indian consumers like to be counseled. They, they like people to guide them through the process. So how do you replicate that online? So for instance, you know, we put a mattress selection tool, kind of a do-it-yourself tool online, which replicates the same set of questions which an offline salesperson may ask the consumer. You know, kis ke liye mattress or, you know, is it is it for the master bedroom? Do you, do you like it hard, soft? So very, very basic things like this. Now, the, the other aspect to this seamless customer journey, which we're talking about is, uh, when we say online is D2C, there's nothing stopping us from being D2C offline as well. So a lot of legacy offline processes, which were earlier not D2C, now we made them D2C. And that's a good way to you know, provide that seamless journey. Uh, you're after sales. Earlier, it used to go through the retailers. Now we do it directly. Marketing promos earlier used to go through retailers. Now the brand does it directly. Offers used to be fulfilled from the retailers. Now brand can do it directly. So there are a lot of touch points where you can actually employ D2C strategies in the offline world and you can digitize offline strategies in the online world to kind of give that seamless experience. And finally, in this category, as with a lot of other categories, the learning or the insight is that the consumer needs at least three to four kind of different touch points. At least one of them being online, at least one of them being offline before he's actually making the purchase decision. So it's it's very important to give that seamless journey. But there, it's it's... It's an easy fix with the tools available. It's just that the intent has to be there. Uh, could you give us an example of uh, perhaps some of the tools that you use to really create this omni-channel experience? Sure. So, see, of course, uh, any consumer-facing brand must have a layer of CRM, well-functioning CRM, which kind of gives you data and insights, right? And for the longest time, we had a CRM which was mining data from offline and then we had our online databases which were not really speaking to this. So there are, you know, in this day and age of technology, there are many such tools available, there are many plugins available, there are many softwares available. Uh, as, as I said, 
the difficult part is to kind of make them talk to each other uh, but uh, it's it's not really uh, you know which tool uh, needs to be used it's as as much as it is the intent to have that seamless journey thank you we'll go deeper into that uh, but before that amit uh, so when purchasing jewelry with a brand like yours is of course a very uh, emotional purchase uh, luxury high end um how do you ensure that you use data analytics that you collect from your customers but at the same time also keep your brand heritage and value system uh, at the top how how do you marry the two so i think uh, if i take a step back and when my friends they were speaking and i was thinking what should i tell to be more impactful uh, at debears actually uh, we just don't only mine diamond uh, we mine data also Uh, so i think we are a very uh, uniquely positioned company and that makes uh, dbs forever mark as a unique brand because we are the only brand in the world which has a direct connect to the mind that means when you buy a product from dbs forever mark you know the source of it and uh, right now in today's age we have technologies uh, which can actually enable you to uh, you know tell that where it is coming from Uh, so as a customer when you buy a product you today you want to know from where what is the source of it where it is ethically sourced even you go for a coffee or you know everything you want to know from where it is coming so this data and having it more secured authenticated way uh, is uh, it what makes a brand more unique and what data does is actually helps a brand to engage more meaningfully like if you look at today's example uh it has done a smart good job having the right audience based thing on the profile of what they have to uh, you know uh, the audience and so does the panel so they have hand picked and likewise the brand do the same thing and uh, so for us at dbs forever mark uh, we we do uh, you know have a very uh, unique uh, position as i said and in our category it is very very personalized Uh, so f- to starting with you know the basic information you know what occasion you are buying uh, why you are buying uh, is it a anniversary or a, a or a birthday celebration or it's a gifting so these are the data capture which we do uh, beyond that what we do is spend millions of dollar at, on on understanding why consumer is buying because for a dibers uh, we have our brand it's a downstream brand but we have a larger market uh, so dibers is almost like a 35% of the market share a uh, value terms we have been number one company uh, so uh, when you look at diamond acquisition study and i was uh, talking to a uh, few of our friend here uh, way back uh, we understood that okay rings are the fastest selling product okay because rings is the first thing people want to buy but what surprised us from that diamond acquisition study is the no spin is the second best selling category then we deep dived you know why no spin uh, so basically if you look at a woman they want to stand out if anybody wants to stand out differently in india is the first thing to do is have a nose pin it is a form of uh, you know expressing freedom boldness uh, you know a little bit rebel uh, and it's a form of a tattoo kind of thing so then we launched a campaign called caprici uh, that is in way 2016 uh, and i think we had an amazing response uh, uh, from that and we continue to do so right now we are running a campaign on avanti uh, which is about uh, you know how a small change in life can have a bigger impact celebrating that boldness again and 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 the center of it uh, is that uh, the, the diamond so as i said uh, we just not only do mining at the retail front uh, but lot of data mining happens when we mine because lot of customization happens when we supply to our uh, site holder that is midstream business and so does it continue to the downstream yeah does this uh, process in any way hamper again the the heritage and the value of your brand uh, the brand image overall because if you keep having to adapt as per the data you collect perhaps you might miss something that's linked to the original uh, intention so just some thoughts on that so i think uh, it is completely other way around actually uh, when you have authenticated information uh, and and if you look into that how that information can help you take a rightful decision uh why i'm saying that if you have a right data you can engage uh, more meaningfully uh, just for the audience like if you look at indian jewelry market uh, everybody uh, would think that you know wedding is a biggest category for us right uh, 
बिकॉज इफ यू हर शादी ब्याह में ज्वेलरी इज ए मस्ट थिंग यू नो यू नीड टू हैव डिफरेंट टाइप ऑफ ज्वेलरी इट नॉट नेसेसरली यू हैव अ डायमंड ज्वेलरी यू विल हैव कुंदन जड़ाओ गोल्ड एंड एक्स वाई सेट बट सरप्राइजिंगली वेडिंग कैटेगरी इज जस्ट ए ट्वेंटी फोर परसेंट वॉट इज द बिगेस्ट कैटेगरी इज द सेल्फ परचेज वाई बिकॉज इफ यू लुक एट द बिगेस्ट इकोनॉमी इन द वर्ल्ड इज not us or china or india or if you look at it is the women economy so women are becoming coming to the mainstream business uh, they are you know having uh, enough money enough decision making process or power to take that decision so they don't want to wait for a wedding to buy a jewelry they buy if they like it they buy it and if you further you know go deep dive you would understand that why in the self purchase category what is that selling more so if a brand has those kind of uh, a macro to micro level of information they can be more meaningful and in our space of luxury uh, it is not just being loud and out there it is about that how personalized you can get you know like yesterday we were de- debating with the team that how i can build in an unpacking wow unpacking experience so when customer is unpacking the product what is that we can do more that they feel more personalized so that being personalized is the key to business and for that data is important i would say wonderful thanks um ankur let's bring you in on this because just like amit uh, puts out uh, your brand too is highly personalized so how do you at triumph being a global brand keep in mind the personalized requirements as per the various demographics a uh, very diverse set of audience how do you go about that so i think uh, laundry is a very very complex business and especially you know the journey over the years especially in a country like india you know being very very commoditized and very very sort of conservative to now you know it becoming more in the open and then you know people embracing it so i'll start from a very very macro level perspective uh, might sound really very elementary but a lot of international brands and local brands make these mistakes so uh, you know uh, globally there are women in different shapes different sizes you know across the entire world and within india as well what a lot of brands do is that they try and copy paste the you know western model or the asian model into different countries and that doesn't work and especially with the lingerie category i mean you know there are so many different shapes and sizes of women across the world so that's something that we found very very early on and very proud to say that we have a state of the art factory in india that manufactures only for the indian consumer the indian subcontinent so to say and a lot of brands what they got wrong was that and similarly we have you know uh, products which are only for the european market and then only for the south east uh, southeast asian market now what a lot of brands do and lot of apparel brands they will get you know the us made product or the europe made product in india and it just doesn't fit it sounds very elementary but yeah a lot of brands do this mistake even today and especially in the lingerie category where you know it is all about fits so i think at a macro level this is something that we realized early on and then we have you know products which are for specific markets and made you know uh, in different factories third party factories uh, for those specific markets so that's at a very very macro level now at the micro level you know even within india one size does not fit all even for one specific size i mean there will be so much difference in between different women so that's where you know our product and our innovation comes in so we are like you know uh, there was a session just before us for raymond so we are also sort of a made to measure in the lingerie category because you know even if uh, you have the same size you know the texture there are a lot of differences and that's where our revolutionary technology comes in wherein you know we are like made to measure even for the specific size you know the materials the 3d designing it adapts to your shape so i think that's how personal we are from a product perspective and uh, of course you know within the country there are so many nuances in terms of whether northeast it's a different market and then that's also something that we've realized so you know we do a lot of research we do a lot of surveys one of the surveys revealed that almost more than 60% and this is like you know uh, very very interesting because more than 60% of women do not know the right size and when this survey came out how do you go into personalization and as an industry leader how you educate people so you know we till today we run this uh, bra fit challenge at our stores and uh, where the women comes in and then you know they are incentivized of course and then they find out that you know the bra that they are wearing is not the right size 
And that's where the education part comes in, the personalization part comes in. And then how do you translate that from in-store to online? Because uh, uh, it's, it's even more difficult, you know, because in-store, you can personalize, you have somebody to guide you, but online, how do you make it right for the person, you know? So we have a very, very unique uh, size calculator on our website. So it, re and it's just not about the, you know, measurements, it's not about the size. So there are so many different parameters uh, that get you the right size even online. And that's how personalized we become, how we get the data. And we've got like more than 1300 points of sale. That is so much data to collect, but how do you use it? So, you know, we use it through different pin codes. How do you target different consumers? Another very interesting thing which came out specifically for the Indian market is that, you know, there are a lot of plus size women, but uh, not a lot of brands cater to that. So with this data driven technology and uh, finding out, you know, where these women are. So we do a lot of campaigns which are very, very targeted to specific segments, even within the store in some markets, you know, you will have a specific plus size merchandise that's there highlighted because you know, a lot of women don't find it. Uh, they don't want to talk about it. So I think from that perspective, there is a lot of personalization we do. And that also translates into marketing campaigns. Another nuance is that, you know, an example, we had a global campaign, which initially was it's sensual. Now we realize that for Asia, it's a little too much in the face, you know, as much as you want to be aspirational, as much as you want to be premium, but then you have to have those cultural nuances in place as well. So, you know, we ran a different campaign, which was only for Europe and uh, the Western markets. And for Asia, it was its personal. So this topic is also so relevant because we are already running a campaign, which is because intimate wear is about intimacy. It's about personal. Thank you for sharing that really fascinating. And just um, as Uttam was also talking about uh, the integration of the online and the offline experience. Um, how does that work for you? And how does, do you keep your customers engaged uh, regardless of which platform they are engaging with you? Uh, so, you know, one of the uh, game changing uh, things for us is the, our loyalty program that we've launched. And uh, what that does is that uh, it seamlessly integrates online and offline. And it gives so much insight into the consumer journey. Uh, you know, the digital journey, what are the pain areas? What are the things that, you know, people are staying on and liking? What content we should use? So I think, uh, you know, the days are gone where uh, you think about online differently and offline differently. Of course, you will always have a channel specific strategy, but how you integrate all of this to have brand con consistency and, you know, what you stand for, I think that's really, really important. And, uh, you know, what uh, we do uh, with this integration of online and offline and what a lot of data points that come in from this loyalty program is that, you know, how you make uh, for individual customer, how you personalize the campaign. So it's slightly easier in store because, you know, we have uh, very, very well-trained uh, experts who are selling and then, you know, they have the entire store or the entire assortment to talk about. But uh, in online, you know, you integrate uh, what the person is looking at, what the time, uh, you know, what is the time being spent? Uh, what are the preferences in terms of color, size, etc. And uh, through uh, AI with this, uh, you know, unique uh, loyalty platform that we have, you know, they will send uh, personalized recommendations. Of course, a lot of marketplaces are doing that as well. And we integrate ourselves with the marketplace as well. But, uh, you know, that's how data comes in. And uh, when you, so one of the things also is that there is a lot of fatigue, you know, in terms of online. You just keep scrolling, you get confused what to buy. You have three windows open, you know, whether you buy on Amazon or whether you buy from .com or whatever. So, you know, uh, when you throw these personalized things, I think it increases your conversion, uh, like, you know, very, very similar to an in-store thing, you know, when the sales advisor recommends that, you know, this is looking nice, or, you know, this is the right size for you, or, uh, you know, this color goes well on you, you know, things like that. Similar in the online journey, if you're able to personalize and give the right recommendations, I think, you're, uh, and what we've seen is that uh, there is a 2x conversion when we give these personalized uh, recommendations. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Ankit, let's bring you in on this. Uh, no conversation about effective marketing campaigns can be had without uh, talking about influencer marketing, user-generated marketing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your strategy at Streamline Beauty and does influencer marketing play a big role for you? Uh, so yes, but you know, what you call influencers, uh, our influencers sometimes are very different. Uh, and we work with both types of influencers. So for example, as a company, we work with salons. 
We are in the salon professional space where we have uh, the best of high performing hair, skin, uh, you know, many petty brands. Uh, so for example, the one thing we know is, let's say if we talk about women, right? Uh, we know that all women like smooth, shiny, frizz free hair, right? And uh, our influencers actually over here are the hairdressers. You know, so it's not necessary a Bollywood actress saying, you know, this shampoo is good or this shampoo is amazing, so people will buy it. Actually, a lot of our customers for our brands are, are people who believe in the hairdresser. So over here, the hairdresser becomes the advocate or the influencer, right? So when you're sitting on that chair, even for men, you know, today, if as men, we're sitting on the chair getting a haircut done, and if our hairdresser tells us, okay, this is a product you should use to set your hair, or this is a you know, gel you should use, we would probably in most likelihood buy it, right? And with women, it's all the more important because they will, you know, anything the hairdresser tells them, they will, because they've got, the hairdresser has his customer on the chair for at least 30 minutes to maybe more, depending on what service you're performing. So that's when the whole journey, that whole first consumer touch point starts. Uh, then in our business, there are two parts of the business, right? There's a professional product and there's a retail product. So you go in for a service, you may or may not buy the home care or the after care from the salon, but you will definitely buy it online. So the whole journey starts from the chair on the salon and then, you know, could end up anywhere from a retail store or an online platform or Amazon. So I think it's a very interesting, uh, you know, space. And, and then of course we do use influencers, invite them again. So all our influencer strategies also are around giving the influencer an experience and she or he talking about that experience and hence, why a, a product should be used, uh, basically. And then data, of course, plays a very important role. Today, you know, the highest searches uh, throughout 2023 by men and women was, are there any products that offer UV protection, right? Who knew that, you know, we always know that people love oils, they love uh, leave-in cream, they love, but not, we didn't know till the data came out that people are actually looking for UV protection, which means protection from environmental damage or from the rays of the sun or from the pollution. So now we're looking at bringing in products which are, you know, obviously solving the prime need of the Indian customer, but also offering UV protection for your hair. So your hair doesn't, you know, get exposed to too much environmental pollution and damage. So it's a very interesting scenario right now with, you know, how data plays a role. And it's like I said, it starts from the chair of the salon and then it all the way goes to all the insights that we get from various platforms. Great, some really interesting examples, quite unexpected ones coming from all our panelists today. Um, Abhijit, I'd love to circle back to you to um, once again ask, when you have such a wide range of customers, because you of course are dealing with international clients, you're dealing with transient clients where you can't guarantee when will be the next interaction with them. Can you share some examples of effective campaigns or strategies that you've utilized at Delhi Duty Free? to uh, really enhance the customer experience? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> just taking a step back for all of us to understand uh, when we all travel, we do bookings, where all do you leave your digital footprints? So there's one set of data which we sit on because we are in the business from last, let's say 13 years, 14 years, and there are people who have shopped with us. Uh, of course we know, like any other company, who shops what. Then there is a data which is with third party aggregators. Now that is typically a data when you do your booking on Make My Trip, you do your booking on uh, uh, Marriott website, you do your searches, wait, where to go, where to travel if you are in France, if where to travel if you are in South Africa. Now what I'm trying to give you is the, your digital footprints give me a data that typically a person who is who always travels for work tends to search for this three months before their travel, two months before their travel and one week before their travel. Right, uh, a family which travels every two years or three years, they typically do this. Now, uh, all travel engines finally land in two engines. There's Galileo, there's another one. Where So what I'm trying to say is globally, wherever you are traveling, whosoever is traveling, the entire digital footprint is finally landing with two or three engines. And from there, different people take the data. We also try and uh, use that data. Now, obviously you don't take data, data as in I will not have your data with me, but I'll have you as a subset of a bigger, category. Now, uh, how we have used it, two typical examples. Uh, we wanted to target frequent travelers. 
Now, frequent travelers need not be high net worth individuals. We wanted to target people who travel international very frequently. We did a deep research, uh, who are they? What do they want? And we realized that these frequent travelers are the people who are traveling every two months. Now, that's quite a lot every two months you're traveling abroad. Now, we imagine that many of them will be high net worth individuals. Many of them won't be ultra HNIs. Now, they may have a Marriott Bonvoy card. They may have a uh, they may have a web, multiple VIP services everywhere. But at an airport, you don't get a VIP service. You are one among all. At max, you are traveling a first class or a business class, right? But you still don't don't recognize that there's 20 first class seats. So there are 20 passengers. So we started the service called uh, personal shopper service. Uh, it's only by invitation. It's a white glove service where uh, it, it's only by invitation. So if we if we have enrolled you into this service then you will be met at the gates of the airport if you are departing and you'll be escorted till the departure gate. No need to shop. When you are arriving, you will be met at the air aircraft gate just outside the aerobridge. Now just imagine 10 business class passengers coming out, only you were met and you were recognized there. Generally, you are recognized after immigration. Already 45 minutes of your the entire waiting journey has happened. Now that has worked fabulously for us. To the extent, I'll typically give an example. We, we launched, uh, I mean, People who love single malls will know about Yamazaki collection. So we took a big risk of uh, launching a collection where each bottle was ranging from 20 lakh onwards. 20 lakhs, 25 lakhs, 30 lakhs. The most expensive was, uh, was, a, uh, was a 65 lakh rupee bottle. Now thanks to programs like this, we sold that in flat 11 days. Someone flew from New York, only bought this bottle and went back. It, it, and they chose us because we chose them to and we didn't realize we went back to our data and we, we saw that he's part of our white glove service. So that's, an that's a very impactful example. Thank you for sharing. Um, Uttam, so again, coming back to you, we, uh, we spoke about how in the mattress industry, touch and feel is very important. You have, of course, also designed uh, online ways in which to engage your customers. But what are some of the biggest challenges that you face? And uh, how, if at all, does data help you uh, come up with solutions for these challenges? So, uh, you know, one challenge in an environment as complex as India and a diaspora and, you know, a consumer base, which is very, very, uh, for the lack of a better word, heterogeneous across different geographies, demographics, all that, right? So it's, it's challenging to do well as a brand across the country while handling these cultural nuances, regional nuances, and that's where data can really help you. Uh, you know, it can help you in serving meaningful campaigns, uh, the right campaign to the right consumer. It can help you in demand shaping. Uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges in our industry, in the mattress industry, is logistics. How do I ensure that the right product is available at the right time close to my consumer? Else, you know, he's, he's not going to uh, maybe upgrade to a branded product. He's going to go for an unorganized or a local uh, brand which is available close to them, right? So there's a lot of background data which helps us in analyzing customer preferences which might be different in a Mumbai or a Pune from a Dhulia or a Jalgao. So what kind of a campaign do I serve to that customer? What kind of inventory do I keep close to that customer at my retailer in a Dhulia or a Jalgao so that he doesn't go to a local brand or an unorganized segment? So these are some of the places where data can really help you. The challenge, of course, is, you know, mining data at offline particularly is not easy, but then also getting that data to talk to different pieces of data sitting elsewhere and you know, you asked my friend here a very uh, relevant question, which he said that, you know, when you have macro and micro data, which are in sync, you get the right insights and you make the right decisions. Else you run the risk of tarnishing, you know, a stable brand image by making wrong decisions based on the wrong set of data. So uh, sometimes you, you are faced with a situation where you have to, particularly in the offline world, marry data with opinions. Uh, because that's the only way to collect data sometimes from a retailer. But that's that's the big challenge where you kind of sift through the noise, uh, try and see patterns, try and see whether macro and micro are in sync, and then arrive at certain pinpointed decisions like this, whether it is serving marketing campaigns, demand shaping, uh, retailer education, uh, whatnot, where 
you know, this data is actually leveraged meaningfully uh, and accurately. Thanks for that, uh, Amit. It looks like you have something you'd like to add. And also, I wanted to ask, uh, as you mentioned before, a very specific niche that you discovered through your data is uh, nose rings for women being one of the highest categories. So uh, when you launch new campaigns, when you launch a new series or product line, are there any specific KPIs that you prioritize as well when it comes to analyzing the success of your new ventures? So uh, for us, like a, we are a basically a global brand. Sometimes it becomes very tricky uh, because your data says something, but you have to be in sync with the global campaign. So what we do is rightfully is that we change a little bit on the timing factor. Okay, uh, so anything new which we try to do, uh, we make sure that it is closer to Akshay Titya and all that uh, time, so that people are in the mood of buying and and. And that's where you measure your success. Uh, for us, uh, how do we measure success? It's, it's just, uh, of course, the as a business, it has to be a good top line. Uh, but also, in addition to that, what we see that if you're running a campaign, uh, if it is a product-driven campaign, what kind of engagement you're having. Uh, Sometimes what happens uh, for us, uh, the hit ratio is very, very critical. Uh, uh, if you have a lovely campaign and uh, imagine is uh, the pro customer doesn't like the product because, okay, it is looking beautiful, but it does not sit well uh, uh, when, when they use it. So, so you need to understand, okay, one is the campaign objective. Uh, what is my top line I'm getting in? What is the hit ratio in terms of engagement, be it online, offline? But what we are looking at is at, at a very micro level. Uh, so for example, uh, at a store level, we have something called a smart tray. Uh, what we do interestingly is that if you go to a typical Forever De Beers, Forever Mark store, you choose on an average five to 10 pieces and then probably you buy one piece. So you know that, uh, you, you know the best sellers. But what we do is that we see the product which have been picked up but not sold. Uh, so they are good designs. Uh, they have been picked up but they are not been sold. So we keep monitoring those data you know, over the time. And the designs which has not been picked up at all, uh, we work on those. Uh, possibly those products are not displayed well, uh, or we need to you know, re-energize the staff to talk more about those products uh, to, to, to the client and explain the you know, detail about the storytelling more meaningfully. So you have to have, as I said, data helps you in engaging at every level. Uh, depending the depending on the objective of the brand, uh, you need to uh, you need to go ahead with that. Uh, for success measure, you have to be at there is nothing called uh, you know uh, you know pass or fail. You have to pass, uh, and I think data has to be uh, there is data enough data everywhere. But you know what is that you want from that data is important. So when we do a campaign, we see on various factors. As I said, uh, we look at the top line, what is that campaign is bringing as a revenue, uh, and of course the engagement level, all the softer aspect of it. Because when you have a good engagement in the softer aspect, probably that will derive to, to the sales. Failure is not an option, absolutely. Uh, I think the world is very ruthless uh, out there. Uh, if you are not good, there is somebody better out there. So I think data only beat sports, you know, look at the sportsmen, like uh, uh, they use data to get better. And for one of my favorite is like uh, Apple Music, you know, you listen whatever music you, you throughout the week and the end of the week, uh, they give you a playlist. Uh, and I think that's where data is driving. You buy in Amazon, the, you have recommendation at the, uh, at the bottom. Uh, you look at uh, Starbucks, uh, you buy, use the uh, Starbucks loyalty program, they customize offer for you. So things are becoming very, very personal. Uh, no matter which space of business you are, uh, be it real estate to, you know, be it anything. Uh, I think that's where data can help you to become more efficient over the time. Absolutely, yes. Um, Ankur, as you were mentioning earlier, the role of AI in creating uh, relevant online proposals for your customers, really ensuring that the online experience is as uh, if not perhaps even better in some ways than the offline experience. Um, what is the role of technology that you're seeing in really uh, enhancing the customer experience? AI, ML, there's so many tools out there now. So what is the role of technology and how do you see the future of uh, your campaigns moving forward in uh, embracing all these innovations? Uh, so I think, uh, you know, there is so much data out there, right? Uh, you are selling through offline platforms, you are selling through online platforms. 
and every channel has its unique uh, you know challenges and benefits so for distribution for example you know uh, you have like thousands of points of sale but you don't get as much accurate data as you would get from an online platform for example so you know how you really put technology to use because uh, you know uh, distribution again uh, will throw in a lot of insights uh, which because you know it will be scattered across places where you don't have your own stores you know for example so how you use that data with online how you use the online data to actually venture out and you know see some of these pin codes have a lot of demand and how do i venture into those locations through offline channels so i think uh, there is a lot of data out there but how do you use it and how do you take it to your advantage and you know leverage data which is there across different platforms i think that's really important and uh, what like i mentioned you know ai and uh, some of our uh, you know tools global so we are fortunate to have a lot of global tools you know uh, so being an international company so i think uh, you know that uh, throws in a lot of insight from other parts of the world as well in terms of what are the trends in terms of you know what does the future look like what is you know the color of the season you know things like that and then uh, you know it gives us a lot of uh, leeway in terms of uh, you know uh, taking those uh, uh, trends for india as well and uh, i think but from a marketing point of view another challenge for us is that uh, you know uh, intimate where it's all about being personal it's all about uh, you know individuality and uh, you know how you embrace and celebrate that individuality and over the years you know uh, there are a lot of trends like inclusivity there are a lot of trends like uh, you know so it's on the uh, on the outside it looks it's a very very glamorous world right but uh, when you look at the consumer it's not as glamorous right because there are so many different types of women so you know with a lot of these kind of data we also customize our marketing campaigns so uh, you know small things like even choosing a model or an influencer uh, it's looked at you know with a lot of uh, you know thought because uh, uh, as much as you want to make it look international and glamorous you also want to make it look you know very very sort of uh, you know with the consumer so you know you have plus size models you have different skin tones uh, even with the influencers you know how you get that uh, uh, so if you are seeing some trends if you are seeing some action in some part of uh, you know the country how you leverage that through micro influencers so i think uh, it's all becoming uh, you know very very narrow very very personalized so you know from getting a a listed bollywood celebrity to how you leverage one pocket of you know the consumer with something that they can relate to with micro influencers so i think uh, that's how data can be really used uh, so there is a lot of data but how you use it uh, you know and also in terms of uh, like uh, some people mentioned you know uh, how you actually have the right size you know the right product at the right place at the right time so i think uh, you know backward integration in terms of supply chain so like i mentioned we have our own factory so you know the entire uh, backward integration from sourcing what kind of you know uh, product uh, you make you know what kind of materials you use what's the lead time so i think a lot of uh, data is also spent not just on the consumer but on the you know backward integration side of it so how you get the product uh, you know to the consumer in the fastest possible way uh, you know you don't miss the trends uh, so i think uh, data is used both on both sides Yes, uh, very relevant point. And uh, Ankit, as we will slowly have to wrap up, I do have to ask you: No conversation on data can be held without speaking of the privacy concerns, right? In this digital age that we're living in. So, how do you uh, approach data collection, analysis, storage, whilst keeping in mind uh, the ethical uh, aspect to it as well? And any just general tips and trends that you're seeing when it comes to data privacy? You know, so when because the kind of business that we are in we actually use all the data that's actually available out there so we don't really have something that we go after we actually use whatever's available talking of privacy i don't know how much is left anymore because uh, you know everything you know you're talking to somebody and uh, you know you open instagram and that ad shows up so it's quite scary and also fun and exciting so sometimes we also choose what to talk about just to see if that ad throws up but so i think privacy is a very uh, questionable topic right now and uh, these are things again not in our hand we are more people who take data or use data and like you know uh, uh, mr abhijit also mentioned that we don't know the person but you know the subset so i think it's it's that's how we approach it as well uh, and yeah i think that's about it from my side 
All right, thank you so much, gentlemen. Uh, unfortunately, time is up, but we will take a couple of audience questions, uh, I'm sure, yep. If, can we get a mic across, please? And if it's for any specific panelists, do shout that out. We'll take about three questions, and then we'll wrap the panel. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for this wonderful session. Very insightful uh, to learn the experiences. Um, of course, I think um, uh, many of you spoke about uh, these are very engaged, very involved purchases purchases, whether it is a diamond or a intimate wear uh, or for mattress or to that matter. Uh, and uh, Abhijit spoke about white glove service. Now, I think that today's context is every customer wants to feel special. Every customer wants that white glove service. It's, it's almost, uh, you know, contradictory that it want white glove service at scale <laughs> online, right? So cart abandonment is a massive problem in many of the categories that you op operate where people add to the cart, they indulge in the shopping experience and they don't buy. Uh, could you please share any campaign or any insight where you were able to leverage uh, either a amazing creative or a consumer insight to uh, kind of narrow down the focus of the customer so that they stop contemplating and buy uh, without abandoning the cart, like something that captivates them or so something that narrows down their focus. Yeah, great question. Is this for any of our panelists in particular? Um, I, I, any, anybody who has had a campaign, like an actual campaign which, which achieved this would be nice, yeah. So uh, I may attempt uh, to answer that. Sure. Uh, so basically uh, what I understand from you is that when the you know, client uh, puts the product in the cart and then most likely they don't buy, okay. I think uh, there is an interesting study about it. Uh, I think uh, all the online uh, players, they are master in that, okay? Uh, what they like, the Amazons, the Tata Clicks of the world and, you know, so what they do is basically, you, you put the product in the cart and then you forget it, okay, I've changed my mind or so forth. But there is a campaign, there is a strategy to connect you back. And now brands are also engaging if it is a high luxury product. Uh, so if you are picking up the product, if it is a high value product, they want to talk to somebody. So before adding to the cart, they can talk to actually a personal assistant who can guide them through the process. So when it, depending on which category you are, like if you are buying shopping from Amazon and you put a product in your cart, they bombard you with you again and again, okay, you know, this is your selection. But again, depending on category to category, there is a clear cut strategy to, you know, either re-engage with the client or, you know, making sure that whenever they go for searching a similar kind of product, you appear on the top of the chart. Uh, but uh, the fallout percentage, uh, depending, as I said, if it is a high value product is uh, probably less, uh, surprisingly, uh, than the low value product. Because in the low value product, you are, Indians are by default are a value seeker. Uh, you know, so if there is a discount, if a competitive product, if you're buying a Nike, Adidas, Puma, and so forth, uh, if you're not specific to the particular product, those things can actually, uh, the discount probably would be one of the reasons that you shift from brand A to brand B. Uh, but again, when you add to the cart, uh, that is the last stage, uh, and most of the dropout happens. I have selected, but let me check something else. You know, So that time, you have to have a clear strategy how you can engage them. Uh, as it, uh, if you have uh, a personal data, like if you have the email ID, phone number, if you have those rights to communicate back, I think that's where you have to reignite uh, those conversations with them. But there is no clear cut formula, do this and they don't buy, they buy only from you for sure. If I, I can go. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I think uh, it, it's a very relevant question and it's very challenging. Uh, you know, when it's about marketplaces, uh, I think, uh, it is more of the role of the marketplace than the brand. Uh, so, but uh, how you track it on your own uh, website is, you know, and even for marketplaces, the entire user journey, you know, and then, uh, you know, with analytics, uh, where is like the, what's the sticky point? But I think uh, from a macro level perspective, uh, what I would say is that, uh, you know, it's all about consistency and the overall experience. So, you know, how you create that consistency every time a consumer comes in either to your store or online. I think that's like the big differentiator why you would buy, you know, competition or why you would buy your brand. So I think uh, it has to be very, very consistent. It has to be very, very seamless and it has to be integrated online, offline because today the consumer is 
you know not just looking at you know one one point of uh, you know contact so they are looking at offline plus online digital marketplaces so i think you know how you create that trust and how you create that uh, you know seamless experience every time the consumer comes in i think from a larger perspective that's how you you know strive to uh, do so that you know these uh, last last minute uh, you know that moment of truth is in your favor uh, you know uh, from a not just one sort of purchase but again and again probably you can try something uh, like every step they go there is something exciting the client is getting okay so maybe you know you need to bundle with some surprises uh, to making sure that they they do the last mile uh, much better yeah we'll take one more question sorry we're out of time oh, okay there's a mic there so hi uh, ankur uh, uh, i'm benazir i'm marketing strategist i love the point you took about ai being used in the back end integration as well as when you use it for the customer and you touched upon a very important point about inclusivity with ai coming through so head on and uh, taking over taking over all our creatives uh, we are doing content with it we're doing images with it we're doing videos with it right so how do you think it's going to impact inclusivity which you have really worked hard to build so far uh so i think yeah that's what i mentioned like you get so many data points from across the world and you know the trends and you know what so we do a lot of research and surveys of what actually the consumer wants you know what the consumer is looking at not just from a sort of a brand perspective but in general so and then of course you know you have so many tools but i think yeah with ai things are going to the next level in the sense that you know now you have influencers who are virtual you know so that is a different level of inclusivity where there is no human involved right so there are so many uh, of these new companies who are coming in with virtual influencers so uh, you see news anchors also who are like robots and virtual influ so i think uh, uh, there is a lot happening in terms of uh, you know uh, technology coming in but it's uh, at the end of the day what the brand stands for you know and uh, there are different uh, you know there will be cult brands and then there will be brands who are more inclusive so i think at the end of the day it's what the brand stands for but i think yeah uh, there is so much data and there is so much technology how how you use it for your brand i think uh, it depends on different brands thanks thank you right ladies and gentlemen i know there's a lot of questions for our esteemed panelists but unfortunately we'll have to wrap up uh, do stay with us perhaps we'll get a chance to talk offline uh, gentlemen thank you so much it's been such an insightful conversation so much knowledge sharing uh, examples case studies it's really been a pleasure to have you here today thank you for that thank you.